So we've worked out this expression by thinking of the quantity r as u0 squared plus v0 squared for fixed r. But in reality, we know that r isn't fixed. In reality, u0 and v0 are these quantities. So we've worked it out for a specific constant value for r, but we need to actually now take this probability of correct for fixed value and average over all the possible values that r can take on if we actually want to get the average value of being correct. So we need to take the expression we just got and average it over all the possible values that the random quantities u0 and v0 can take on. So we actually need to average this via the density function, you know, it's a weighted average over all possible values for u0 and v0. So that's what we're doing right here in this chart. This expression is being averaged over the density function. And this double integral, I can actually write, because of this, I can write as two double integrals. One times this minus this times this. And that's what I did here right here in the second line. I wrote it as a double integral minus another double integral. And that's kind of nice, because look what happens. When I do a double integral over a joint density from minus infinity to infinity, well, that's just one. And I have one minus, and now I have this double integral that I need to work out. I have an exponential kernel here times this joint density for u0 and v0. But again, we actually know how u0 and v0 are distributed. We're operating here under the assumption that s0 of t is being transmitted. So under that assumption, we know exactly the distribution for u0 and v0. So we can plug in and continue working this in. So let's do that. We know that these are independent, so it really factors into the product of two marginal density functions. And we've also worked out before what the variance is and what these means are. So we know exactly what those are. So the integral from the previous slide is 1 minus the double integral, which really factors into a product of two different integrals. Since this pulls apart, our double integral also pulls apart. It pulls apart into these two pieces. I have the u0 integral and I have the v0 integral. If we want now, we can write it like this. It's 1 minus this one integral with respect to u0 and this other integral with respect to v0. So we're kind of burying the notation here. There's a lot behind this script i term. It's really this big integral. Same thing here. This script i sub v0 is really this complicated expression. But the form is very simple. 1 minus an integral times an integral. Now we need to work on what are these. And if we can figure out this one, we really know this one. So let's just focus on this one part and then we will be very close to being done with working out this integral. So let's work on the argument of the integral i sub u0. So the argument of the integral is this. It's the product of these two exponentials. The product of two exponentials I can write as a single exponential where I've added their arguments. That's all I've done here. I've just added their arguments. When I expand this, I get u0 squared minus 2 u0 times mu u0 plus mu u0 squared. And then the other u0 squared comes from here. So from here I got 1 u0 squared. From here I got 1 u0 squared. That's why I have 2 u0 squareds right there. Okay. And then what am I doing from line 1 to line 2? All I'm doing is writing mu sub u0 squared in kind of a funny way. There's there's a whole one here, and I still have a whole one here, but I've added in a half and taken off a half. So you can probably guess why I'm trying to do this. I'm going to do kind of a complete the square operation here in just a minute. So I've split this into two pieces. I left it alone, then a part that adds in and a part that cancels out. And now I'm actually going to force a 2 in here. If I put a 2 there, I can factor that 2 out. That 2 gets factored out. If I put a 2 out here, I need to put a 2 on the denominator, that's why that turned to a 4th. If I put a 2 out here, I need a, a 2 in the denominator there, that's why that turned into a 4th. If I pull a 2 out, I need a 1 half here to cancel out that factorization. And now I can go ahead and complete the square. Looking here at the inside, I can actually write the interior part here as this squared minus a 4th times mu sub u0 squared plus 1 half mu squared sub u0. Okay, so all we're doing is some algebra to complete the square. And I got that part in there. These combine. Minus a fourth plus a half is plus a fourth. It turns into that. And now we're almost there. I can take this, 
and I can factor it back into two exponentials again. This part right here, and then this part right here. So this is kind of the leftover piece that I'm lumping down into here, and there's a two out front, so I had to bring the two in, and I can write it again like this, that that two and that two cancel, and over here, this two turns into a four, because I actually have an extra two here on the denominator. So kind of ugly math. All it really is doing is completing the square so we can write this a little bit more nicely. And this is nice because now it looks like an e to the minus something minus a mean squared over a sigma, and then really just a constant term over here. There's nothing random over here. This is completely deterministic. This now looks kind of like a Gaussian PDF type term. So that's why we went through transforming this into this Originally we had a random quantity here and a random quantity here. Now we only have a random quantity here. And that's very useful and we'll see that on the next chart. So everything on this slide had to do with simplifying the argument of the integral i sub u zero. So this is our simplified argument. We can go plug that back into the actual integral now. If we go back and plug that into the integral expression for i sub u zero, this is what we get. So we worked on simplifying it to the integrand into two different pieces. This part gets pulled out because it's constant, and now this is the only part where u0 shows up, the random piece. From this line to this line, all I'm doing is refactoring this just a little bit, and the reason I'm doing that is because now look, this piece right here, this is just the PDF of a Gaussian random variable whose mean is one half mu sub u0, whose variance is sigma squared. So this part right here collapses to just one. I'm integrating a PDF from minus infinity to infinity of a PDF. That equals 1. So i sub u0 simplifies to this because that collapses to 1, which I can write as this. So we now have a closed form expression for i sub u0, and it is equal to 1 over root 2 e to the minus mu sub u0 squared over 4 sigma squared. All the math that I've done to simplify this integral of i sub u0, I can do the exact same math for i sub v0, and guess what it's going to look like? It's going to look exactly like this, but instead of mu sub u0 squared, we will have mu sub v0 squared. So let's go back to what we were computing. We were trying to compute the probability of error given signal 0 of ascent, which we know can always be written as 1 minus the probability of being correct given signal 0 of ascent. The probability of being correct, we, were, we had written as 1 minus i sub u0 times i sub v0, and this is what we've been working on the last slide or two, trying to understand what those integrals are. We now know what they are. Each one is 1 over root 2, e to the minus mu sub u0 squared over 4 sigma squared, or e to the minus mu sub v0 squared over 4 sigma squared. So after I take that product, 1 over root 2 times 1 over root 2 is a half, and then in, instead of writing two exponentials, I write it as one exponential where I've added their exponents. From here to here, all I've done is noted that 1 minus 1 is just 0, and then this just turns into a positive 1 half, because negative negative gives me positive. So my probability of error turns into this. And then finally, we know what mu sub u0 and mu sub v0 are. This is equal to alpha naught cosine phi. This is equal to alpha sine phi. If I square both those, I can factor out an alpha naught squared, and I'm left with a cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1, and then eventually I end up right here. 1 half e to the minus alpha naught squared over 4 sigma squared. And this is what we stated earlier, before we started the derivation, that the probability of error given signal 0 of ascent was equal to this. And we have now rigorously justified why that is true. We still really need to work through and figure out what the probability of error given signal 1 ascent but if you do all the exact same steps, you can pretty easily justify to yourself that this is the expression you would get. It's exactly the same, except instead of alpha 0, we have alpha 1. So we have successfully computed the probability of conditional error for both signal 0 and signal 1, and we have these nice, simple expressions that tell us what those errors are. If we want, we can generalize these. Remember, in the derivation we just did, we assumed that everything was optimal and everything was matched. We could go through and kind of uh, redo it where we assume that at the correlator, the what's used at the correlator doesn't match the baseband waveform what was transmitted. So in general, at the correlator, we use W0, which might not equal M0. So if we want, we can go back to our expression for alpha naught and replace it with this dot product in general. 
Similarly, for the noise, we've assumed for our analysis that the noise variances were the same. In general, though, we know that we can write the noises like this. So if we wanted to, we could have a more general result going back to the results from the previous chart and substitute in this dot product for alpha and substitute in this um, n naught norm squared quantity here. And this would be a more general result. But we know that when everything is perfect, when w i is m of i, and when w of i is m of i, that this collapses to this. And that's what we saw on the previous chart. And finally, let's go ahead and just take a look at what these probability of errors look like. This curve here plots as a function of signal-to-noise ratio in dB space what the probability of error is equal to. This blue line right here is the Q function of square root of 2 over e, 2 times e over n naught. So this represents the probability of error for binary signaling when you're using antipodal signals. The red line is square root of e over n naught. So it's missing that fact factor of 2 there. And this represents the probability of error for binary orthogonal signaling. So it's not quite as good as antipodal as we know. And then the quantity we've been working with in deriving in this last few charts is the black line right here. This is 1 half e to the minus 1 half e over n naught. So you can see it's even worse. For some fixed signal noise ratio, say 10 dB SNR, non-coherent only has a performance of just a little over 10 to the negative 2, whereas orthogonal is more like 10 to the negative 3, and antipodal is more like 10 to the negative 5. So this chart quantifies the performance degradation that you have when using non-coherent modulation. You do not get as good a performance as when you use a coherent scheme, whether that is orthogonal coherent signaling or antipodal coherent signaling. So there's definitely this performance penalty when you don't know the carrier phase, the way you have to demodulate leads to more errors for fixed signal-to-noise ratio.